one more niche edges from Nazi domination to take stock of her land and future. Holland, a diligent little... Her own lord than the city of New York. But her kingdom swings east and west around the world. Her famous capital, Amsterdam, is often called the Venice of the North. Amsterdam is a charming combination of things new and old. You won't see wooden shoes, lace caps, and the traditional dress when the modern family pedals to market and business. These disappeared long ago from the city streets. Only in some of the farming and fishing districts do folks still cling to the old style. Today, the queen lives here when she visits Amsterdam. Back in the 17th century, Holland's immortal painters, Rembrandt, Hals, and Vermeer, lived in surroundings like these. The buildings themselves reflect Holland's modern democratic spirit. Her government was one of the first to enact social security laws as early as 1901. She can be proud of her leadership in the newest of architecture and city planning. Modern dwellings, office buildings, and apartment houses have grown up in many of the ancient cities. Hollanders can travel about the country either on one of the many highways or in speedy electric and diesel trains which provide the Netherlands with one of the most efficient railway systems in the world. A myriad of gaily colored flowers dot the fields where hundreds of years ago the first bulbs imported from faraway lands were planted. The flowers are pretty, but relatively unimportant. Though every care must be lavished on the bulbs which are exported by the millions. legendary sailor is the Flying Dutchman of 20th century Holland. He's the industrious pilot who flies around the world several times a month as part of his routine job. If he's a Royal Dutch Airlines pilot, he usually flies an American-made plane. But Holland itself manufactures aircraft of international renown. may point with the greatest pride at the dikes which protect much of their below sea level land. A quarter of their land they conquered, not by the usual bloodshed and gunpowder, but with sweat and toil and perseverance. They wrested their land from the ocean and, at the same time, provided themselves with an efficient network of canals. The map of North Holland province pictures this conquest. Today you see solid land where less than 300 years ago, islands rose from the ocean. The Dutch pushed back the ocean to tie up the string of islands to the mainland, thus adding rich acres of soil to the original slim boundary lines. Holland startled the engineering world when they began their largest reclaiming job in 1920. The famous Zyder Zee still separated the northern peninsula from the mainland, threatening the dike walls and periodically overflowing in costly floods. With a great 18 miles long dike across its throat, they would bottle up the Zyder Zee. They planned to add four sections of land or polders by draining the biggest part of the Zyder Zee. In the center would be an artificial lake called Isol Lake, 16 inches below the level of the North Sea. The Northwest Polder was the first to be completed. Dike building is not for the impatient. It took centuries of backbreaking experiment to provide these workers with the know-how of reclamation. Step by intricate step, these men achieved their satisfying goal.
much of the work nowadays still has to be done by hand, there is no doubt but that their fathers before them would envy the more recent aid of machinery, which partly takes the place of many painstaking procedures. for the rivers. Locks and pumping installations regulate the water level for the new waterborne traffic. of repair crews constantly working to keep the dike in first-rate condition. And so now there is solid land where once there was water. No other nation can look at its map with the same pride and say, this we made with our own hands. What other people can farm where their ancestors used to fish? Dutch cattle graze contentedly in the rich new meadows. And settlers were attracted by the new land and built their homes and villages here. have always been known for their deep religious convictions. And they have always been respected as a peace-loving people. invaded the Netherlands. Without warning or the slightest provocation, they unleashed upon their innocent neighbor the full terror and fury of a devastating blitzkrieg. The force of the Luftwaffe was revealed to a shocked country. A purposeful army floated relentlessly down from the skies to penetrate hard-held lines of defense. Swiftly, they paralyzed communications and destroyed transportation. There was no stopping this ravaging horde. And when negotiations for surrender had already been concluded, Rotterdam Center was blown to bits, systematically, completely, shamelessly. Bewildered and resentful, the population gathered to read the first proclamations of their treacherous conqueror. While their queen, prepared to fight on, succeeded in reaching the shores of England, nothing would weaken her determination. The Netherlands cabinet soon followed. Plans for Holland's share in the war effort were discussed at once. A major part of the loyal merchant marine fleet managed to reach friendly ports where they eagerly joined forces with their allies. Not one of the free Netherlands ships was ever idle. Dutch ships carried vitally needed war materials throughout the world. Dutch warships took to convoy duty. Dutch ships carried the wounded from the war fronts. 
and Dutch vessels participated in all the major landings, North Africa, Sicily, Anzio, and Normandy. German Hollanders and Indonesians trekked from all corners of the globe to the United States where they were trained as pilots. And some of them returned to their homeland to bomb plants being used by the Germans for the manufacture of war materials. sabotage the execution of German plans. Wrecking trains and hampering transportation were just some of their methods. These Dutch toilers, who through the years had witnessed the tedious reclaiming of their land, had to stand by and watch the Germans breach their dikes and inundate the land. Fearing Allied landings, the Huns ruthlessly flooded the country, thus wiping away in a few hours the work of generations. But ever resistant and hopeful, the Dutch never despaired. On September 4th, 1944, the Allies staged a three-prong airborne landing near the cities of Arnhem, Nijmegen, and Eindhoven. Parachutists had to gain and hold the bridges over the rivers for the oncoming British Army entering Holland from the south. Across the skies of Western Europe, a message of strength and hope was written by these soldiers of the skies. These airborne liberators of the southern provinces of the Netherlands were greeted and assisted by enthusiastic Dutch underground forces who had waited so long for Holland's D-Day. At last, they could come out from under cover and fight their battle of resistance openly. There was not only water to plague them. A strong German rear guard had dug in for a determined last stand. The hour before freedom was not an enviable one. Dutch homes became liberation casualties. Eindhoven, the operation was successful. Liberation was swift and complete. A jubilant population quickly posted signs reading, Long live the Queen. And no time was wasted in rounding up the few Dutch collaborationists. On November 1st, 1944, from the West, British battleships opened rocket fire to free Walcheren Island, guarding the entrance to Antwerp. With Germans still on Walcheren, the vital port of Antwerp would be useless. Royal Marines stormed the towns. Solid German defenses had to be overcome inch by inch. Every yard gained and many a man lost, but their efforts resulted in final victory. people. An unforeseen moving day was thrust upon the people. Food had to be found and delivered to families stranded by the waters. 
Those who remained on the island had to invent new methods of transportation. Bombardment added to the destruction caused by the floods. The combined ravages of war required the evacuation of almost the entire population to the few unharmed spots on higher ground. But meanwhile, people attempted to salvage whatever little remained of their personal possessions. Their homes gone, their land flooded. These people never lost faith and carried on unswervingly in the Dutch tradition. Some were housed in this church, where they ungrudgingly set up community housekeeping. Deprived of normal conveniences, they accepted their situation in the proud knowledge that throughout the centuries, the Dutch always have managed to overcome temporary setbacks. Princess Juliana was speaking of people like these when she said, Keep your pity for the weak, for our terrible fate has made us stronger than ever before. It was a heartwarming occasion when Queen Wilhelmina was able to make her first visit to Holland in the liberated southern part of her country. She wanted to see for herself the sufferings of her people and the destruction brought upon them. She got first-hand information from the inhabitants and from the authorities in charge. And wherever she went, she received a spontaneous ovation. In Middleburg, she saw the remains of the famous Gothic town hall, which was destroyed during the German invasion. Her sympathy went out to all her countrymen. She thought of the starving population of the largest cities, which were then still occupied by the Germans. And she remembered those hundreds of thousands of loyal Hollanders who were torn from their families and deported to Germany for forced labor. She could not forget the thousands of Dutchmen who were dying in German concentration camps. Nor could she forget those patriots members of the underground forces who were tortured and executed by the Germans for the crime of refusing to accept the Nazi doctrine. None of us will ever forget. More clearly than ever, she realized the plight of Holland and the gigantic task of reconstruction which lay ahead. Immediately, Although they had access to little more than primitive instruments, the Dutch set out upon this reconstruction task. Not waiting for the arrival of modern equipment, they started rebuilding the dikes by the simple methods of their ancestors. They could not afford to lose a minute in reclaiming their land. This land is essential for growing the crops to feed this hungry nation. Once again, this determination typifies their indomitable spirit, you can't beat the Dutch.